Hi everyone, welcome to your second lockdown special. This one is going to be situation ethics. So situation ethics is your second ethical topic that we have done. First one was natural law. You can obviously find the video for that one on YouTube as well. Uh, and this one is on situation ethics. What comes next is euthanasia. So now is probably the right time to mention that when it comes to euthanasia, this isn't just what is euthanasia, because you did that in year 10 GCSE if you did RS at school. This is about, <clears throat> so excuse me, this is about what does natural law think about euthanasia or how can you apply situation ethics to euthanasia. So whilst this, this makes the ethics topics quite unique, Whilst you might get a question on natural law on its own, you also might get a question applying natural law to, um, to uh, euthanasia or comparing natural law and situation ethics to euthanasia. So always keep that in mind now as you're doing situation ethics. It isn't just situation ethics on its own. It's actually also potentially applying it to euthanasia as well. But that'll be next week once we get there. So let's get cracking then on situation ethics. So I'm just going to make myself smaller. That should just about do it. Let's make this bigger. I don't want that go away and we'll get going so let me set the situation ethics scene you'd be now walking into my classroom um obviously you cannot at this point due to uh, uh lockdown etc but you uh, but just use your imaginations you'd be walking into my classroom excited to learn the next topic in philosophy and you'd be greeted by the all you need is love by the beatles that song pretty much summarizes what this theory is about situation ethics is about love that's pretty much in a nutshell. This video is probably going to be about 50 minutes long, but that's pretty much it. So let's see how we're actually going to fill this video. The first thing that you need to know about is the three different approaches to moral thinking. Now, you will not get a question on this, but it's important that you realise where situation ethics falls in moral thinking. So first of all, you have legalistic. It is exactly as it sounds on the tin. What does the law tell you? Legalistic laws accumulate to cover all eventualities, e.g. once murder was prohibited, this law then had to be consider, consider its ruling over other possibilities, self-defence, abortion, war. A legalist must constantly update, develop and add new laws to remain up to date. Such fixed laws as found within the Catholic or Protestant teachings, for example, so natural law-esque, have problems when it comes to updating these laws because there's no second, third, fourth edition of the Bible. Uh, there's no updated version from Jesus. So legalistic is the approach where you follow the law. Now, if any of you are studying law at college, you will know that you will pretty much never get a textbook. Why? Because textbooks are constantly need to be updated because laws are constantly changing because new situations are coming uh, about that the law doesn't directly go to. Or uh, for example, if any of you are studying criminology as well, you will recognise how actually some crimes then just become deviances and some deviances then become crimes. So crime is um, and, and ethics and what's right and wrong, etc. is very fluid. It goes up and down. It changes. So that means that the law has to change with it. And therefore, that's the legalistic standpoint that you might follow. Antinominan, that is quite a mouthful, is completely the opposite. So you have legalistic at one end and antinominan at the other. They are absolutely bipolar opposites. Um, a person following antinominism doesn't apply any kind of law, rule, principle or system of ethics. Every moral decision is unique, following no patterns or preferences. Nish and Sartre were fans of this who believe that there are no rules to follow, only your own choices bit of a um, kind of do what you want sort of approach, uh, quite a, a risky one as well when taken to its full extreme. Situational or situation ethics is going to fall in the middle of these two, it's the middle ground. Moral actions depend on the situation, antinominant, so look at the situation that you're in, but you also need to consider rules, ethics and principles of the community and the tradition, so you have to Look at the situation you're in, your personal situation, but then apply as well the rules and the ethics that are around. However, 
a situationist is prepared to set aside the rules, the legalistic in the situation if love is better served by doing so. Basically, the answer to any situation ethics question is love. What do we apply? Love. What is the, ro the one overriding absolute? Love. What one thing must you apply to every single situation? Love. You're getting the idea. Loving people, not laws. So what this is saying is follow the law unless it doesn't work for your situation and love actually is better served. Therefore, believes in an absolute rule of love that needs to be applied situationally. Now, sometimes people, um, sometimes students talk about situation ethics as being relative or subjective. It isn't really because it still has the one absolute of love. So it's not quite as absolute as natural law that as you find primary precepts and is very set in stone. This one though still applies love unconditionally. So you need to know a little bit of background for situation situation ethics to see where it falls. So the first is looking at the book. Of course, the book, I mean the Bible. So this is specifically the New Testament. Jesus obviously talks about love central. Everything that pretty much Jesus talks about is to do with love. When Jesus was asked to say which commandment in first, Jesus answered, the first is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, you shall love your God with all your heart. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these in Mark 12. Now, of course, you don't need to learn that whole quote. Um, all you really need to know is that Jesus talks about love. So even if you just remember the first bit, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, an examiner knows you're not going to make that up. Um, and then you can just paraphrase the rest of it. Or love God with all of your heart. That's fine, then paraphrase the rest. So again, quotes are your choice, but you are logically not going to be able to remember that quote. Um, normally you can learn quotes from about 10 words max. So only take a little part of that, but just know that Jesus spoke about love as his top priority. St. Paul, who can forget St. Paul? Don't forget he's our conversion fella from religious experience. So St. Paul was Saul, fish scales fell from his eyes, found God, that guy. So St. Paul says, and now faith, hope and love abide and the grace of these is love. Um, nice short quote if you get the end, but grace of this is love. Um, and again, you can always mention St. Paul in an essay in 1 Corinthians. Now, Fletcher is the founder of situation ethics. So the argument called situation ethics is Fletcher. And if you notice, it's 1905 to 1991, so he lived through both world wars. Um, but it's also fairly recent. Now, I know it's still 30 years old. Uh, um, but as far as philosophy is concerned, when we look at the oldie oldies of like 2000 years ago, it's fairly recent. It's 30 years Fletcher applies these Christian origins of agape love in his moral system. He roots it in the New Testament. He looks at Jesus's actions and how Jesus set aside laws and broke rules for the good of people. Now, that's very, very important. When we come to looking at the personal Jesus topic later in the spec, you will see how Jesus really did push against society and the laws because Jesus did not believe in following all the laws that were made and actually applied love instead. We also look at somebody later on in the year called Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer believed that he lived uh, under the Nazi regime, Nazi Germany, um, and he believed that the law. So don't forget, in Nazi Germany, the law was to um, declare when you when who, who was Jewish, etc., uh, to the Gestapo. So that was a law that you had to follow. So if you were a legalist or followed the legalistic perspective of morality, then you would have to declare where some when somebody was Jewish, knowing full well that they would then go um, uh, to their death. Whereas, so this theory says, hang on a minute though you can break the law if it's the most loving thing to do that's so like the people that looked after Anne Frank for example so what Joseph Fletcher did was he looked at how Jesus broke these rules sometimes when following what was most important with love for Fletcher situation this is a Christian ethic that should focus on flexible message of forgiving grace founded on love rather than rigid rules laws and commandments even though the churches disagree this is not a popular theory with the churches and there he is there's mr joseph fletcher in his little dicky bow tie all right so if you're with me together We'll play a little game now, Doug, get too excited. It's not a really exciting game. Um, called Who Am I? So to feel 
or act towards the right person to the right extent at the right time for the right reason in the right way. That is not easy and it's not everyone who can do it. Eh? What? That's like saying the same word over and over again in different ways. Who have we come across in our time on philosophy who is very much bumbly with words to get to their point? And if you're thinking, hmm, this sounds like an ancient person, maybe even an ancient Greek, it doesn't quite sound like Plato, maybe Aristotle, you are correct. Um, Obviously, the uh, link I'm making there is the quote that we looked at on the prime mover. The prime mover thinks about thinking, on thinking, of thinking, or something like that. So, quite, um, sorry, Aristotle is never that clear in what he's saying. But actually, what he has here is quite an important quote. Um, what he's saying is to feel or to act towards the right person, towards a specific person, to the right extent, so having the right amount, at the right time for the right reason in the right way. So basically, it's respond to the right person in the right way. Um, and it's not easy. Not everyone can do that. Um, so that's what he's saying there. Second round. So let's give you a second chance if you didn't quite get that one. If we speak of the moral act as an individual act, then every particular moral act must be good or evil by reason of some circumstance. Now, this one is far closer to home. This is someone that we've covered very, very recently. And the clue is where it says must be good or evil by reason. Who have we covered recently that talks about reason? and talks about good and evil acts. If again you're thinking Aquinas, you are correct. Right, so we looked at the book, we looked at a couple of quotes that you could use if you want, or paraphrase. We now need to look at the people. These again are inspirations to Joseph Fletcher. Fletcher studied Archbishop William Temple. Temple's ethic was personalist and love-centred. There is only one ultimate and invariable duty, and its formula is, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. How to do this is another question, but this is the whole of moral duty. Now, I quite like that quote from Temple. I quite like his sentiment there. What he's saying is, obviously, the Jesus teaching, love, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. That's the Jesus teaching. I like how he adds that bit in afterwards, though. How to do this is another question. For me... That's the whole issue with situation ethics. I know I'm bringing a criticism in already. I've not even started it yet. But it's fantastic on paper. Just love everyone. Brilliant. Mind-blowing. Great. How to actually do that, though, in reality is a completely other question. And unfortunately, Joseph Fletcher doesn't really give you any direct... Because it is not legalistic and it's not anti and it just kind of apply love, crack on, uh, you'll realise how actually it's a great sentiment but needs maybe a little bit more direction. From this, Fletcher concluded that love, regardless of context, regardless of the situation that you're in, is always good and right in every situation. Love is the universal. Your love is the only universal. What that means is love is the only thing that every single person should, uh, should follow, should do, should apply. You have a few names there, don't worry about the numbers. The numbers are purely just to help you remember that there's three. You don't need to remember all three. You could just remember one and evaluate it. That is fine. First, we have Rudolf Bultmann. He argued against the idea that Jesus sought to establish some new ethical ideology. Jesus had no other ethics than love thy neighbour. So basically, Jesus wasn't doing anything groundbreaking. He just applied love. That's all he's saying. Karl Barth argued God's commanding is not a rule, but applied individually to each specific example. So again, God isn't telling you what to do through the Ten Commandments. It's not one rule that applies to all. He's saying look individually and again, look to your specific example and apply love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I've just mentioned Bonhoeffer to you a second ago. He says the will of God in any situation is based on the needs of one's neighbour and the model of Jesus. As we'll find when we study Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he is so interesting. So, so interesting. I love teaching Bonhoeffer about Bonhoeffer um, because he went up against the Nazis. He really, he believed so strongly that you should 
break the law and do what is right for the people that he died for these beliefs. So for me, that really is practicing what you preach. And Bonhoeffer is king of practicing what you preach. Um, so he is promoting the needs of one neighbor and the model of Jesus. Right. Situation ethics then. We have a word, a new word there that you need to learn is called Agape. If you call it agape, that is fine. It's not an it's not a, an oral exam. It's a written exam. So as long as you spell it right, that is fine. But the word is uh, agape, and this is agape. Then um, there should be uh, a, an accent uh, above that. I probably just did the PowerPoint quite quickly, so apologies for that. Um, and this isn't just love. Agape is not just love. Um, it's unconditional love. That is extremely important. This is not just love. It's unconditional love, and I'll explain what all of this means in a second. Agape is the Greek word meaning love. Very early on, the word was adopted by Christians to refer to Jesus's sacrificial and generous love for others, how he died on the cross for us. What makes unconditional love then different? It is love for others does not have to be returned. It's selfless and it's the core of a life of faith and it's the measure of good and bad. It's important to note that many people this argue this theory is relativist. It's not. Um, it is that there's no universals that you apply um, or the one universal teaching for all is love. So, again, we've mentioned that already. So unconditional love is not a love to return. It's not a sexual love. It's not a friendship love. It's not a family love. It's just an unconditional love for everybody. Particular judgments might be relative to the situation, but the absolute maxim of love must be applied. Maxim is a general rule. So maxim, general rule of love must be applied. Um, if we were in lesson, um, I probably won't get you to do this at home because it's more of just of a little bit of a brain break, bit of fun, um, is to create an Agape Day card because obviously we have Valentine's Day uh, in a few weeks' time. So rather than a Valentine's Day card, we create an Agape Day card. So uh, you do an unconditional love card for someone else that's not based on uh, returning it or anything like that. So that would be a little bit of fun that we, that we do, um, but it's not really relevant at this point. OK, some questions then that I would like you to consider and I would like you to write down your thoughts for these. So I would like you to write down your thoughts for these three questions. Uh, three, no, five. Oh, five questions. Let me just go back. So I'd like you to write down your thoughts so far on this theory. Do you think agape, unconditional love, is helpful when making ethical judgments? Do you think it works? So from what I've said so far, does it work? Is it fair to judge a situation um, as ethical, good and bad, based on this idea of agape. I will then send you some biblical extracts. I would like you to work out the extent to which agape is religious. So look at the extracts. Is this just a religious idea or not? Uh, and again, why is this maybe helpful? So why is your conclusion? Is it religious or could it be non-religious as well from the extracts? And why do you think that might be helpful? Um, for any of you, um, pretty much any general biblical extracts that apply in some way helping one another or talking about love works for this one. Um, to what extent is agape non-religious and is this better and does it really matter if agape is religious or non-religious? Now, this is very, very important that you get your head around this, obviously. Fletcher is coming from it, certainly initially, from a religious perspective based on Jesus and St. Paul. But do you think, for example, if any of you were sat at home and thinking, well, I'm an agnostic, I'm an atheist, I'm a humanist, but I still apply unconditional love, I still love my neighbour and I'm still nice to people, then you're coming from a non-religious angle. So... Can you apply agape? Can you apply situation ethics without the religious spin? So that's what those questions are asking you at the bottom. Fun factoid. Fletcher gave up his Christian belief, but he never gave up on situation ethics. He states the difference between a Christian and non-Christian situationist is that the former Christian uh, clearly and directly equates the good of agape, uh, good with agape, so this altruistic love that puts needs of others before those of oneself, while the non-Christian just finds some other reason to apply agape. So it might be Aristotle's flourishing, it might be your conscience, it might be just your 
Freudian. It might be a Freudian or something. It might be just because you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to let people down. Or it might be because you, if you do something horrible to somebody, they might do something horrible back to you, etc. So it's you can apply situation and agape for religious and non-religious, but it's more that the religious angle looks at Jesus, the altruistic love, etc. Whereas you might find from a non-religious perspective another base to 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 put it on. All right, so within situation ethics, you have uh, six and four, six fundamental principles, and the four is coming on the next slide. You need to learn these, folks. Um, there's not the order is not necessary, so you can uh, mix them up and do yourself a little acronym to help you remember them if you want to. But you have to learn these six. You have to mention all six in the exam. You don't have to put them together. You can break them up. We're going to apply these to euthanasia when we do the euthanasia topics. So, the six fundamental fundamental means most important principles that the situation should apply. Love is the only thing intrinsically good good within itself good because it's good this is the deciding factor in christian decisions it's what the final decision is based on justice uh love is for your neighbor friend or for so if you don't like them you've got to be nice to them it's the end result it's the deciding factor the end result has to be love and it's situational of course based on the situation the four working propositions Again, you have to know these. The six and the four work hand in hand together. Um, this is pretty much the only structure you get within situation ethics, though. This is the only guidance you get. And again, you have to apply these to your individual situation and circumstance. So how it works, this hence the working propositions, how it works, being practical rather than always following belief in ideologies or systems. So pragmatism is practical experience not theory so doing what works from your experience rather than following a particular ideology or system relativism every situation is relative to christian love positivism love does not need to be demonstrated to know it's true and good situation and it depends on christians freely choosing that faith uh, really choosing faith that God is love. So giving first place to Christian love. So basically, you might not always see it, but you have to have faith that it's there. So that leap of faith, that leap of faith that love is always there. And first, finally, uh, personalism, person-centred. Focus on putting people first and taking responsibility for others. So personalism, it's personal to people. It's person-centred. So personalism, it's person-centred. You're doing really, really well, folks. Really well. Conscience. Conscience for a situationist is not about a soul or spiritual voice. It is wrong to see conscience as a noun. Now, I think this is very, very clever. Conscience isn't a noun. It's not a name of something. It's a doing word. It's a verb. So conscience is not just the name of that voice in your head it's not just the name of that gut feeling you get when you've done something you shouldn't have done it's actually a doing word conscience is the process of doing something it does not simply review and reflect upon actions done or decisions made but on the process of making the decisions it's about the process and the actions this process of moral reasoning is formed by situation and of course ding 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 love okay so that's situation ethics the theory that's it you're six and you four add a bit of bible in there make sure you mention joseph fletcher talk a little bit about conscience that's it that's the topic very very straightforward if anything it's just a little bit dull having to remember the six and the four but it's necessary um but that's the theory as i said it all just centers around this concept of love unconditional love But like any theory, we now need to look at some evaluation. We have here a William Barclay quote. Uh, please do write all of this quote down in your notes. I love this quote. I think this quote is brilliant and I really, really like what um, Joseph, uh, no, William Barclay is saying here. So I think this is a brilliant quote. If we insist that in every situation, every man must make his own decision then first of all 
we must make man morally and lovingly fit to make that decision. Otherwise, we need the compulsion of law to make him do it. So I would like you to put this quote into your own words. What is he saying? So please pop the quote into your own words. And then, do you think he's supporting situations? Is he a supporter or is he a critic? So I'm just going to give you a second to reread the quote. Do you think he is a supporter or a critic? You can also pause the video because obviously it's important in order to help you with your evaluation. You can't force the process. You've got to work along at the right speed in order to be able to get that evaluative tongue developed. So pause it if you need to just read over the quote, but I would definitely like you to try and work out, do you think he's supporting or criticising? Okay, so with this quote, what William Barclay is saying there is that in every situation, every man has to make his own decision. That first of all is very, very important. It's saying that you have to take responsibility over what you do. If you're doing something, if you are dealing with a situation in a certain way, you have to take you have to take responsibility over that. You're doing the action. You can't blame somebody else or, or something else for why you behave in a certain way. He then says that if this is the case that we need to take responsibility, then first of all, we must make sure that man is morally and lovingly fit to make that decision. So if every man is responsible for the actions they do, you have to make sure that you are first of all going to do it morally and, and lovingly. So you have to make sure that you come from it from a right standpoint. Um, and he's saying that if you aren't morally and lovingly fit, if you aren't going to deal with every situation in a morally and lovingly way, then you need the law to make you do it. So Joseph, um, William Barclay, sorry, I think is leaning more towards critic here. Because what he's saying is, again, like I said at the beginning of this video, situation ethics works excellently on paper. This idea of apply love, love your neighbours, love your foes, unconditional love for all, following Jesus' teachings, don't always follow the law, brill. Great. Sounds a fantastic plan. But if everybody is looking at situations, in reality, does everybody apply love? In reality, are people moral? And so what William Barker's picking out here is, unless people are lovingly fit and moral to make those decisions in a situation, if they're not, you need the law to force it on them. So if it's a situation that says, leave the law behind and apply love, what he's saying is, mm, people don't always do that though, so then they still need the law there to make them do it. Really, really like that idea. The strengths, it is adaptable to specific, to specific situations when rule-based ethics are not always helpful. So a lot of you have already criticised natural law. Your evaluation so far I've been receiving for natural law is excellent, so very well done. And obviously because it's a rule-based ethic, it might not be helpful because it's rule-based. So this now is very open. It's no rules at all. Do you prefer this? It provides a guide and support in a situation rather than rules. You are morally responsible when applying situation ethics as you cannot rely on the advice of others or set laws. Um, however, please note, it is a mistake to interpret Fletcher's theory as offering a solution to solving moral problems. So he's not offering a solution. He's not saying, you know, all these different moral situations, here's the solution, no. He did not think ethics worked that way because the modern world is so uncertain. He's not prescribing behaviors to do. Instead, he says you just need to be aware of certain principles, the six and the four, when making your moral decisions. This is in the hopes that you make the right decision. So he's basically giving you a manual, a framework to help that you then make the decision when you're obviously putting it in practice with your conscience. 
This contrasts most of the ethical theories which posit their arguments are the answer to ethical questions. So most of the ethical theories we look at, we're going to look at Kant and utilitarianism as well. They kind of tell you what to do, what you should and should not do. This does not. This just offers a framework that you could use if you wanted to in order to help you make your decision. Do you think that's a better approach? Do you think that works? Again, that is your evaluation. So one of the activities I am going to get you to do is to compare uh, natural or situation things. Which do you prefer? I know very clearly which one I prefer, uh, but I'm not going to share that with you yet. Weaknesses. What is a situation? So, for example, um, you all have friends where everything's a drama, everything's a situation. Do you then apply situation ethics to that? What is a situation? Um, it's teleological, new word for you folks. So teleological means it focuses on outcomes. As long as the outcome is love, you can do anything you want to get there. So it focuses on the outcome of love. But can you really predict correctly and accurately that whatever action you do, it will bring about love? Sometimes very, very hard to be able to predict that your action will bring about love. It's not about the action. As long as the outcome is love, it doesn't matter what you do to get there. It doesn't provide simple answers to difficult questions, unlike a rule-based ethics. So when we did natural law, I gave you examples like euthanasia or abortion or IVF or something like that. So again, let's apply abortion. If you wanted to apply abortion to this, um, someone comes to you, one of your friends, and says, I'm, I'm, I've made a mistake, I'm considering an abortion, and you just, and, and they say, what do you think I should do? And you just say, you know, well, what's the most loving thing? I'm here to support and help you. Uh, and you just show them unconditional love. They'll probably come to the end and just go, well, I still don't know what I need to do. What do I need to do? What do you think I should do? Oh, well, you're just going to do what's the most loving thing. It's It doesn't provide simple answers. Whereas at least with natural law, it goes against reproduction. It goes against preservation of life. But then it could be that all the society supports abortion. It depends how you wish to argue it. Um... But at least it gives you a bit more of a concrete guideline to use. You might prefer, though, that it is more open and subjective. Again, that is your line of argument and your choice. When love is served in a given situation, this focuses upon the person and persons involved. How far do you consider the people affected? This is called the ripples in the pond. Because um, obviously if you popped a pebble in a pond, it creates ripples. How far do those ripples go? So again, with the abortion, do you look at the individual that is considering abortion? Do you look at the doctors that have to do it? Do you look at their family of that person, how they respond? Do you look at society? How far do you apply the love concept? Similarly, do you consider the future effects and look beyond the immediate situation? So if you do this, what effects will it have for future generations, for example? So if I drop this piece of litter, um, you know, do you consider the effects that are, are waste? If you waste a lot of food and it's all, um, you know, or, or, or bin a lot of things, are you really considering the future effects this might have on future generations with the environment? You know, how far do you apply this love concept? Fletcher is selective in which biblical passages he uses, those that are only central on love. However, defence of this might be that the centrality of love is at the heart of Christian message. So some people have criticised um, him for only specifying love, picking on love, but then again, isn't love centred to the Christian messages anyway? Um, humans are fallible. We are flawed and often fail to consider the interests of others. We're quite selfish. As a, as a, as a human race, as a race, we are quite selfish. So do we really, now just stand in someone else's shoes, are we really good at looking to the love of other people and beyond our own interests as well? Are we looking at, do we really know how to put others before ourselves? This, this is different when you have children. So a parent would always do whatever they need to do to help and save their children. But that's a parent love. We're not talking about parent love here. We're talking about unconditional love for all. Fletcher's ideas surrounding conscience are vague uh, and it's more about acting conscientiously. So the bit on conscience, that's it. So what is conscience? How do you apply conscience? How is it a verb? Uh, quite vague and leaves quite a lot unanswered. Um, a few more weaknesses. So these are philosophical weaknesses. Why are they philosophical? Because they're presented by philosophers. 
Reverend John Wickwiri uh, argued that situationism is fundamentally and incurably individualistic, not a basis for social morality. Now, what he's saying there is very, very good. Basically, he's saying this is just too individual, that every individual is making their own individual decision. How can that be a basis for a social morality for everyone? We then have DZ Phillips uh, argues... When one, this is a, a, you've got to do this one in a posh voice. When one finds oneself in situations where whatever one does, one is going to hurt someone. Um, with his Donald Trump-esque hair. Um, what Dizzy Phillips is saying here, and again, it, it's quite good uh, once you get past all the ones, uh, um, is that you're always going to hurt someone. So even if you do what's nice for that person, what's loving for that person, you're going to hurt somebody in that ripple. So finally then, you need to now get off the fence. Do you think this, this argument is helpful? Do you think this argument works? Yes or no? No fence sitting. Does it work or not? Does the rejection of absolute rules make decision making just too individualistic? Or do you think ethics should be individualistic? It's over to you now to cast your vote. So that's it, I think. Yes. That's it. That's your next theory down and done. You shouldn't find it too difficult. That shouldn't be too hard. Um, if you've got questions, it, chances are it's because you're thinking evaluative about things that haven't been mentioned or discussed. So it's probably a weakness of the theory rather than a lack of your understanding. Um, but... I will send you activities to do. I will send you support to go with this. You need to make sure you have natural law and situation ethics down, that you understand them, that you have no questions about them before we start looking at euthanasia. So it's very, very important that you get those two in your understanding as much as possible. But obviously with natural law, it's quite structured. You have your hierarchy, moral code, your fat, your primary precepts and your secondary precepts, your doctrine of double effect. With this, you have the influences, the book, where it comes from, etc. You then have your six and your four with your conscience. So an agape, obviously, with the ideas of agape. So both fairly straightforward when you break them down into simple chunks so again any questions or problems send me a, a comment underneath check out the blog um, and I'll be uh, doing the next video uh, in a week or so's time on euthanasia thanks very much everyone let's cancel you all down now see you folks bye